1. Why did the Israelites sing this song? What does this show about their attitude at the time? 2. Fill in the blank. This was was a song of underscore 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 underscore. 3. What do verses 1, 2 show about their relationship to God? 4. Who did they give the credit for victory to? 5. What decision did they make at the end of verse 2? One, the Israelites said, I will sing to the Lord. They made a decision, a decision to praise God for what he had done. This was in response to God hurling the horse and the rider into the sea. The Israelites didn't need to do anything except watch what God would do to save them. But they should be thankful to God and praise him for it. And they did. 2. They said he is highly exalted. They recognized that God is the highest. It wasn't their praise that made him exalted. He already was exalted. Praising God is not lifting up higher because God is already the highest, the supreme power, and supremely holy. Praising Him is merely a recognition of who He is and a confession of His rightful position. This is basically the difference between flattery and true praise. Flattery falsely lifts somebody up to where they don't belong. True praise recognizes somebody's genuine achievement. 3. The Israelites use the personal pronoun my four times in verse 2. What does this show? It shows us that the Lord is their God. It denotes a close personal relationship and mutual attachment. It conveys a closeness that just saying He is the God doesn't. Do you view God as your God? 4. They also that their Father is God. They knew they had the father-child relationship with God, a relationship that is expounded upon more in the NT in verses such as John 1.12. God is not everybody's Father. He is the Father of believers. Why use this word Father? To depict the relationship they had with God. One, why did they spend so much of the song singing about the death of Pharaoh's army? One, they recognized the just side of God's character and called him a warrior. We don't generally think of God as a warrior, so what does this phrase mean to you? It means that God is not only loving and merciful, he can and will punish the sinners who reject him. Also, warriors protect their families, so God will protect us too. 2. They rejoiced about the victory God had over the Egyptians. They gave all the credit to God. It is very clear that all the credit belongs to God. Yet many times, even when it is clear that God deserves the credit, people take it for themselves. We should remember to always give God the credit for the successes in our lives. It is natural to rejoice in this type of victory. Imagine, for example, that Russia pointed all its nukes at Japan. Japanese citizens feared death and the destruction of the entire country. At the last minute, God miraculously turns the missiles back and slams them into Russia. Will people cheer? Of course they will. This is human nature. One, what methods did they use to praise God in these verses? 2. What lessons can we learn about what will happen to God's enemies? 3. What is chaff? 4. What does verse 8 show us about God and nature? 5. What does verse 9 show about the hearts of the Egyptians? 1. We see in these verses a lot words of praise for God. What words of praise can you find in verses 6, 7? Discuss each one. Majestic in power. Your right hand shatters the enemy, greatness of your excellence. 2. God's burning anger. God does get angry. There are many instances in scripture where God gets angry. Examples? He gets angry over sin. He gets angry over rebellion. He has a great amount of patience, but when this patience runs out, his anger is scorching and can destroy people very quickly. Always maintain a close relationship to God and repent of sin. Follow God, and he will not be angry with you. 3. They praised God's control over nature. The Red Sea looked massive, wild, untamable. It was deep and wide. Yet God is depicted as merely blowing some wind from his nostrils, and the sea is tamed and a path opens up. It is as easy as breathing for God. It doesn't use up his strength and the level of difficult for this and all other miracles he does. 
from one to ten, is one. He never has to exert himself. Big and small obstacles are the same to God. Nothing. Four, the Egyptians' attitude is shown clearly in these verses. They desperately desired to catch the Israelites, to conquer them and get the spoil. They wanted to destroy them. Their hate was burning at record levels. But try as hard as they could, they could do nothing to the Israelites because God protected them. One, how did they praise God in these verses? Two, the question in verse 11 is rhetorical, but how would you answer it? How is the Lord different than all other gods? Three, what were God's motivations for saving them? Thirteen, four, what are God's motivations for saving us? Five, how did God help them after saving them from the Egyptians? One, how did they praise God in these verses? Firstly, they praised God for His superiority to all other gods, and by implication, His superiority to everything else. They asked some rhetorical questions and the answers are clear. There is no one like God. God already demonstrated this by humbling the Egyptian gods and magicians' priests. Go through each praise of God in these verses. The number of ways to praise God is unlimited, because God is unlimited. 2. Verse 13 tells us God's motivation for saving them. It wasn't because they were lovable or deserved it. It wasn't a reward. It was because of His mercy, because of His love. It was His choice to show this mercy to them, to save them. Once He saved them, He didn't desert them. He continued to lead them. We can see this theme throughout the whole Old Testament. Even when man is unfaithful, God remains faithful. God never forgets, and God never abandons His people. 3. Verse 13 also repeats use of the word redeem. God redeemed them from Egypt. One, what effect did God's miracles have on the peoples throughout the nearby lands, specifically the promised land? Two, why were the Israelites called your people? Three, what implications should the fact that they were the purchased have for them? Four, what place are they referring to in verse 17? 5. What role do you think Miriam had in all of this? What does the fact she was a prophetess show us about her? 1. God's miracles weren't done in a vacuum. He had purposes for them even beyond Egypt and the Israelites. One of these purposes was to show his power to all the pagan nations in that area, especially the ones in the promised land where the Israelites were going. What words are used to describe the emotions of the people who heard of what God has done? Tremble anguish, dismay, trembling, melted, terror, dread, and motionless. Get the picture? They were terrified. Their hearts melted away. It was as if they couldn't move because of their fear. They heard what God had done. They knew He was the true God and their gods were nothing. Remember that God had said He did these miracles for the purpose of letting all nations know that He was the Lord. Now they did. But instead of repenting and turning to God, most of these people hardened their hearts further and refused to give in to what they knew was the truth. 2. Verse 17 says that God purchased them. They belonged to God. He owned them. This should give them even more motivation to serve God. As we learn in Romans 12, 1. 2. We should be living sacrifices to God. Give our lives to Him in response to all that He has done for us. 3. They believed that God would take them to the promised land. They had faith in the promises that God had made to Abraham about 700 years before. They believed this land was special and that God himself would dwell there. This was true as God did dwell there first in the tabernacle and later in the temple. It was to be a sanctuary. This has two meanings. Firstly, it is a place of refuge. It was a place where they could be safe from the Egyptians and from all the countries around the... God would protect them. Secondly, it is a holy place. It was to be pure of all the pagan and evil practices of the cultures around them. It was to be their land forever throughout all generations. 4. Verses 18-20 are an editorial's note in the middle of the song, reminding the readers of the reason for the song. Miriam is depicted as a prophetess. This is a special title given to only a few women in the Bible. It denotes their special role as messengers from God to the people around them. Miriam led the women in the singing. 
She seems to be the choir director for the women's part of the chorus. It isn't organized, but appears to be spontaneous worship. Do you often praise God? How can you praise God? How can we improve in our praise to God? What can we learn from this song about how to praise God? 1. Discuss our own lives, and if we are actively praising God. Praising God is something done publicly and privately. It is something done with our mouth, but also with our hearts. The music and tone of voice is not so important to God, but making a joyful noise is. What is the difference between praising God and being thankful to God? Praise is the fifth finger on the hand of prayer. Discuss ways we can improve our worship of God. One, how long did it take them to forget the amazing praises of this wonderful song? Why did they forget? What does this show us about them? Do you think their praises were real? Who named herself Mara in the Bible? Why? Two, was grumbling the correct response in this situation? What should they have done instead of grumbling? Three, are we sometimes like the Israelites, praising God in church on Sundays, and then days later grumbling or forgetting what he has done for us? What is the solution? How can we praise God continually throughout the week? How can we maintain a heart of gratitude? One, the Israelites were so emotional and excited and enthralled and joyful just three days before. Now they quickly forgot again all that God had done for them. This is just like when they were next to the Red Sea and the Egyptians were coming. Humans' fleshly nature is just like this. We quickly forget the good things that God has done for us and focus on the difficult things right in front of us. Grumbling and complaining is easier than being thankful. 2. God once again saved them in spite of their lack of faith and grumbling. We see God's great and abundant mercy. Instead of wiping them out for the their lack of faith and short memories, he graciously and quickly cleansed the water so that they could drink it. This was yet another miracle since no known tree can cleanse polluted waters. 3. Applications. Discuss our own tendencies to complain and grumble. Let everyone list one, two things they are thankful for. Try to make time to spend time in prayer praising and thanking God one by one. One is the first account of a larger section of Exodus describing the three-month journey, 1901, from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai, 1522, 1827. This passage contains the Israelites' first encounter with life in the wilderness. After three days of traveling in an area that had no water, they came to a place called Merah that had water, but it was undrinkable. The people became angry and confronted Moses about this problem. Moses in turn cried out to the Lord, who miraculously provided sweet drinking water for all the people. This problem, which was a test from the Lord, resulted in a statute that required the people to depend on the Lord for their needs. Failure to believe that the Lord could and would provide for all their needs would result in physical suffering through disease. 2. After an unknown amount of time, Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, which is located in the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula. It is important to observe that the Lord through Moses led the Israelites into the wilderness. The wilderness is not a comfortable place to be. As such, it sets the stage for the testing of the people. 3. Having departed the Red Sea, the Israelites went three days in the wilderness and found no water. The three days recalls the three days journey that Moses asked of Pharaoh during the plagues, 318, 5, 3, 827. Moses wanted to go three days into to the wilderness in order to worship. Instead, they came to Mara. The word Mara means bitterness, and it used three times in this verse to communicate not only the condition of the water, but also the condition of the attitude of the people. The problem they faced was that they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. Mara has been associated with the current day Ayan Hawara. 4. Deprived of sources of water, the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? The word grumbled is stronger than simple complaining. It is used throughout the Exodus account to refer to open rebellion against the Lord. They were questioning his ability to deliver and provide. This is amazing in light of what they experienced just a few days earlier at the Red Sea. 
they fail to see that if a sovereign, omnipotent God can part the waters to deliver his people from Egypt, he can provide drinking water for his people in the wilderness. 5. During the plagues, Moses wanted to go a three-day journey to worship the Lord. Now they were three days out of Egypt, and instead of worshiping, they complained. They knew that the Lord was their deliverer. But could he also be their provider in a hostile world? To them at this time, the answer appeared to be no. They could have gone to the Lord with their needs, believing that he would provide. But instead, they grumbled, complaining that being in the wilderness was a bad idea. One, contain the Lord's response to the grumbling of the Israelites. After being confronted by the people, Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. It is worth noting the difference between Moses and the people. Moses asked for help, the people blamed and complained. The word translated showed is the verb form of the word Torah, which is the Hebrew word for law. Also, there was nothing magical about the tree. It was a visible demonstration of the Lord being able to change the natural world to provide for the needs of his people. 2. The Lord's provision here is an amazing act of grace to his unbelieving people. He could have judged them severely, but instead he met their needs without them having to labor for it. God answered the intercession of Moses by directing him to throw a tree into the brackish waters of Merah. 3. There was a stipulation that went along with this gracious provision. The Lord required something from his people. To express this requirement, he made for them a statute and regulation, and there he tested them. The phrase, a statute and regulation, probably means a binding ordinance. 4. The content of the statute was conditional. He said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians. The people of Israel were required to do four things. A. Give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God. The phrase give earnest heed is intense in the Hebrew. It is from the Hebrew shama, to hear, and could be translated, diligently obey. This involves listening to what the Lord says in order to understand it and obey it. B. Do what is right in his sight. Listening and obeying the word of the Lord should result in doing what is right, the Lord himself being the standard. C. Give ear to his commandments. This also involves more than just listening. It includes active obedience to what is heard. D. Keep all his statutes. The Hebrew word for statues is related to the verb to inscribe or to engrave. It is used to refer to the laws of nature, Psalms 148, 6 concerning the stars, Job 28, 26 concerning the rain, Proverbs 8, 29 concerning the sea. It can refer to a rule or prescription. 5. If these four requirements were followed, the Lord promised that he would put none of the diseases on you, which I have put on the Egyptians. The exact nature of the diseases is not specified, but it is reasonable to assume that the ailments would be similar to those suffered by the Egyptians during the plagues, boils, etc. 6. The Lord then says that the reason that they can escape the diseases is because he, the Lord, am your healer. The Lord said that he was the healer of the people at a time when the waters of Merah needed to be healed. Not only did they need water, they needed to be healed physically. The means to that physical healing came through spiritual healing of obedience. They had witnessed the Lord's miraculous provision for their needs. This was proof positive that the Lord was not only their deliverer, but also their provider. To this point, God had provided for their well-being unilaterally. It was now time for them to play a part in their well-being. 7. After the testing at Mara, they came to Elam. Elam was located about seven miles south of Mara, in what is now known as the Valley of Garandel. This means that they did not have to go far to find even more potable water. It apparently was a pleasant place to be, because there were 12 springs of water and 70 date palms, and they camped there beside the waters. In light of what they had just experienced, Elam must have seemed like a paradise. 8. To sum up, this passage is a vivid account of the Lord's people who, having just been delivered through the miraculous parting of the Red Sea, started to rebel against their deliverer. They doubted his goodness by leading them into the wilderness. They doubted his love because they were running out of water, and the lack of water would have caused a slow and painful death. 9. Such grumbling has been a part of God's people for a long time. It becomes a major theme during the Exodus. 
The people grumble when they are in physical need of something, and the Lord provides for them, usually through a miracle that everyone witnesses. They will test God ten times, Numbers 14.22. This might be a literal ten times, or a figure of speech that means many times. It doesn't tell us which testing counts as the first, but grumbling seems to be the primary thing that tests God. But this passage focuses on God testing them by giving them something to do, a responsibility to discharge in order to receive a blessing. 10. Even in the New Testament, Paul warns against Christians grumbling against the Lord, I Corinthians 10, 10, 11. The Corinthians lived in a city filled with centers of mystical cults. There is little doubt that the Christians in Corinth experienced hostility from both these cults and from the Roman Empire as well. Yet Paul told them not to grumble. The Lord could deliver and provide in the midst of their spiritual wilderness. Each believer should expect the Lord to lead them into a wilderness that we might learn to trust Him, that we might learn to embrace responsibility and come to know Him by faith. The wilderness is neither fun nor comfortable, but it shows us our inadequacy and reveals the quality or lack thereof, of our faith. If we allow it, it will also show that our Lord is completely capable of meeting our needs. He wants us to believe in Him and obey Him, because He is worthy. Comment, what did you think of this Bible study on Exodus 15? We would love to hear your thoughts. Share below in the comment section.